This is a general disclaimer. Redlands Community College attempts to have the most accurate and up-to-date information listed in its content and delivery. However, your education is your responsibility. Redlands Community College or Roy Smith makes no guarantee in the accuracy of this information in this video and accepts no liability for the informational video. The information expressed is strictly the opinion of the author and the presenter, which is listed in the reference near the end of the video. This information is designed to supplement your own education or initial education and should not be used to replace any current academic program you are enrolled in. View the information and content at your own risk. Thank you. This is going to be Chapter 26, Disorders of the Head, Ears, Eyes, Nose, and Throat. Uh, key concepts. Upon completing this chapter, you will understand that abnormalities of the head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat may be traumatically induced or medically caused. That careful questioning and assessment is necessary to determine if the patient's complaint indicates a serious underlying condition. Chief concern, head and neck regions. Anatomically and physiologically, it's very complex. At least six different medical specialties within this area. Head and neck systems, uh, very functionally different. Significant overlap between the symptoms. Head. We, we can have things like headaches. Um, extremely common complaint. Paramedic must be familiar with certain characteristics. Benign would be something like cluster or tension headaches. Catastrophic could be something like a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The ear. Earache. Uh, frequent complaint, common causes of an earache or otitis media or otitis external. externa. Otitis media is a middle ear infection and otitis externa is an outer ear infection, like the canal. Symptoms of this are tinnitus, or ringing in the ears, and dizziness and vertigo. And this may be associated with the chief concern, um, as far as the dizziness and vertigo. So dizziness is the disruption of the internal ear or the vestibular system, either from mechanical forces or from physiological causes. Uh, it can give a patient the feeling of spinning. Vertigo abnormal sense of motion, uh, often but not always of a spinning nature, and there's several different types of vertigo. There's peripheral vertigo, uh, which is due to vestibular organs located in the inner ear, um, central vertigo, vertigo due to disorders of the central nervous system, benign proxismal positional vertigo, vertigo due to a change in head position, also, we have diseases that are kind of chronic, like Meniere's disease. It's defined as vertigo, tinnitus, or ringing in the ears, uh, hearing loss. Uh, it's caused from an inflammatory response in the inner ear, which causes rapid onset of vertigo symptoms that slowly resolve within a few hours a day. Uh, disequilibrium is also a term in this, uh, feeling off balance or unsteady on their feet. We're going to look at a figure in a table, 26.1. Uh, figure, which is the vestibular organs, and then 26.1, the table, uh, peripheral versus central vertigo. This is figure 26-1. Uh, the vestibular organs in the inner ear are responsible for balance. So, when we look at these. Primarily these organs here. Each one of these are set up with little hair-like projections in them. And as fluid rotates across them or moves across them, it moves them and kind of tells our position. Um, if there is fluid movement through there, that's in the e and we're sitting still because of inflammation, infection, or whatever, very easy way of getting uh, vertigo. This is table 26-1, peripheral versus central vertigo. And the first thing we're going to look at here is the onset. In peripheral vertigo, it's kind of sudden. In central vertigo, it's kind of a gradual thing. Uh, intensity, moderate to intense in peripheral vertigo. Um, central vertigo, usually less intense and poorly defined. Well, I think I'm dizzy. Associated symptoms, occasionally hearing loss, tinnitus, nausea, and vomiting occur in peripheral vertigo. Uh, in central vertigo, varies, but usually less associated symptoms. CNS signs and symptoms in peripheral vertigo are absent, 
but in central vertigo, they're usually present. The eye. Blurred vision, eye pain, foreign body presence, or redness. Uh, common concerns on this. Range in severity from conjunctivitis or pink eye to corneal abrasion or acute angle closure glaucoma. Generally, the complaint of blurred vision, uh, very nonspecific. Time of onset is kind of important with this. Causes could be anywhere from form body presence, infection, glaucoma, retinal detachment, corneal abrasion, and stroke. Acute angle closure glaucoma. Pressure within the eye increases rapidly and dramatically and can cause dysfunction of the optic nerve, leading to permanent loss of vision. Ocular migraines intense headache and nausea and vomiting along with blurred vision or even blindness. Chemical irritation can also occur, can range from a simple irritation to vision loss and even physical necrosis or decay of the eye. This next figure we're going to look at is figure 26.2, mid dilated pupil seen in acute angle closure glaucoma. And, and this is caused from a a spike or an increase in the pressure in the eye and the pupil becomes less and less responsive. The reason it becomes less responsive is because the pressure changes within it didn't allow the, the, the muscles that will change the pupil to fully function. Nose, epistaxis or nosebleed uh, occur for a variety of reasons, range in severity as well. Trauma to non-traumatic causes, epistaxis has a result of trauma high likelihood for other injuries if they took a shot to the head. Uh, categories, uh, anterior, result of bleeding at a specific vascular plexus. Uh, collection of small blood vessels called Kesselbach's plexus, and we'll see a picture of that here in a second. And then the posterior area, usually result of bleeding from the splenopalatine artery and the posterior nasal passage, and we'll kind of point that out too. Figure 26.4, cross-section of the nasal passage, showing the location of Kesselbach's plexus in the anterior portion, or what we get from anterior epistaxis, and the splenopalatine artery from posterior epistaxis. And this is a little area up here. The face and head, to begin with, is highly vascular. But this is Kesselbach's plexus, which would occur in the anterior section, and this is the splenopalatine artery. This would occur in the posterior section. Now, you can still have bleeding from anywhere through here. The throat, throat pain. Uh, not a common complaint in pre-hospital setting. Causes range from severity, uh, peritonsular abscess, uh, forms in the posterior tissues of the mouth around the tonsils, and occurs as an extension of bacteria infection involving the tonsils. There's also a retropharyngeal abscess, bacterial infection located in the soft tissue between the pharynx and the vertebra. Epiglottitis, infection and inflammation of the epiglottis. And this is what uh, causes closure of the uh, glottic opening, leading to swelling, potential airway obstruction on the epiglottitis. Ludwig's angina involves the spread of bacteria from the infected tooth or teeth along the tissue planes into the floor of the mouth. And figure 26.5, we're going to look at, is retropharyngeal abscesses and epiglottitis. And this would be our retropharyngeal abscess, which is essentially a pus pocket. back of the throat, and this is the glottic opening. There's a tube right there, and this is the epiglottis, which is red and inflamed and swollen. Um, it can, it's highly vascular, it can completely occlude this glottic opening to where we can't even see it. History. Considerations. Good history is always important. OPQRST mnemonic onset time and nature, whether it was sudden or it was gradual, and what the patient was actually doing whenever the symptoms occurred. Uh, any kind of past symptoms that the patient might have as well are important. 
uh, as far as their past medical history goes, considerations is extremely important. Obtain as, as thorough as a past medical history as possible and a medication history. Uh, what the patient is currently taking, their current medication list, and anything that has been changed recently. Upon examination, adequate physical exam is imperative. Uh, pertinent systems are involved, the heart, the lungs, airway, breathing, and circulation, and their mental status. Head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat, considerations on examination. Ears and eyes, assess for symmetry. As far as the ears go, uh, if you have an otoscope available, uh, an otoscope is used to evaluate the inside of the ear canal. Redness and swelling would be indicative of a otitis media of some sort, whether it be externa or be, uh, otitis externa or otitis media. One of them is on the external canal and one of them is actually the middle ear. Uh, eyes, we use an ophthalmoscope and this is used to examine the posterior wall of the eye. As far as assessment considerations, overall assessment, uh, narrow your differential diagnosis. Is this going to be a stroke? Is this an altered mental status? Is it something no more simply than uh, a migraine? Head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat conditions. Most are specific to one body part. Uh, symptoms of vertigo would be lightheadedness. As far as treatment considerations, uh, usually specific to the condition. General principles still apply, airway, breathing, and circulation. Considerations, headache and dizziness, transport comfortably with frequent reassessment of vital signs and mental status, ocular foreign bodies or chemical exposure, immediately continuous irrigation of their eyes with tap water or normal saline if available, and the management of epistaxis, protect the airway and stop the bleeding. On evaluation, uh, nausea, common complication of vertigo and epistaxis, uh, common symptom also in increased intracranial pressure, and central neurogenic pathology. So be aware, nausea alone it does not say that the patient is possibly only having vertigo. It's just a symptom. So you're going to have to differentially diagnose what the nausea is caused from. Disposition. Uh, disposition for almost all head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat complaints is to the emergency department. Patient may sign off, symptoms completely resolved. Um, and the patient on this, if they're, re they're ready to go AMA or if the symptoms resolve, as long as they're willing to take or accept the risk on that, it will be fine. In conclusion, disorders of the head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat range from troublesome to life-threatening. Understanding of the pathophysiology of these conditions will assist in identifying patients who have life-threatening conditions. References for this were taken from Myers Professional Paramedic Volume 2, Medical Emergencies of Delmar Learning. And if you have any questions concerning this chapter, feel free to give me a call. My name is Roy Smith, roy.smith at redlandcc.edu or 405-219-7613. Thank you.